Uh, the Honorable Member for Elmwood Transcona. Well, uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I am pleased to rise to speak to uh, third reading of Bill C-19, which of course is the Budget Implementation Act, and um, thought I might uh, treat it as a little bit of a, a case study, Madam Speaker, because in the, in the debate about our electoral system, we often hear that uh, Canada needs strong majority governments in order to have decisive decision-making and, and action and not to end up with, with a hung uh, parliament. And, um, and that this is one of the main motivations for some to oppose uh, electoral reform and, and particularly forms of proportional representation that tend to lead towards or lead to more instances of uh, minority parliaments and minority governments. And so my own view is that the, the process around this, this budget bill, without having been a perfect process and without the bill being a perfect bill, was actually a decent uh, process. And so I want to talk a little bit about some of the improvements that were made to the bill during the course of this and some of the ways I think it suggests that we can make progress on other issues in this parliament by members of various parties uh, working together, not always members of the same parties working together. And I think this process, in fact, showed um, that members can be nimble in terms of who they're working with on particular issues and still get outcomes that make sense for Canadians and that benefit a lot of uh, Canadians. We don't need one, one party con having 100% of the power here in Parliament in order to make substantial progress for Canadians. So the, the first example that I would point to is around changes to the disability tax credit. And um, we heard a fair bit of testimony at committee uh, on, this, on this point. A Conservative colleague of mine on the committee brought forward uh, an amendment as it happens, uh, and, and this is the way, Madam Speaker, as I'm sure you will know, but folks listening at home may not. Um, parties will typically submit their amendments independently, um, and uh, sometimes there are pleasant surprises when you receive the package. In this case, uh, an identical uh, amendment. I was happy to work with Conservative coll uh, colleagues and, and my Bloc colleague on the committee to pass an amendment that would see the disability tax credit requirements of, you know, kind of, for, you know, having to show that you spend 14 hours a week as somebody with type 1 diabetes um, tending to your condition, whether that's injecting yourself with insulin, going to the pharmacy to get the insulin, monitoring your blood sugar, and other things that folks living with type 1 diabetes have to do. And then they often have to prove this every year despite the fact that type 1 diabetes is not a condition that simply goes away, and despite the fact that the requirements of the condition don't simply go away, nevertheless, they've had to constantly um, show again and again and again, reminiscent of some of the stories we've heard over the years out of Veteran Affairs Canada, where amputees, veteran amputees, have to demonstrate every so often that, in fact, their leg is still missing, and they, they are still an amputee, and continue to require the same help, Folks with type 1 diabetes were having to continually show this. And so we were able to bring forward an amendment and pass it at committee um, and even overcome some procedural uh, wrangling where, where the amendment was initially ruled out of order. We're happy to overrule the chair at committee on that point and, and very pleased that the speaker saw fit to uphold the will of the committee in respect of that amendment when it came back to the House. What that means concretely for people who are living with type 1 diabetes is that they're no longer going to have to do all of that paperwork with the bother and the expense that comes with it in order to qualify for the disability tax credit. Once they've qualified once, um, um, having type 1 diabetes, that will be sufficient in order to qualify them into the future. I think that was a really hopeful exercise, not just hopeful for the Parliament in general, but also hopeful because we know that when it comes to Canadians living with disabilities, um, that there has not been enough meaningful action on the part of the current government in order to serve that community. And we saw that, we saw that last June when the government presented a bill for a Canada disability benefit that had absolutely no details about what that benefit would be, how much it would be, what the eligibility criteria would be, how it might impact other, other benefits that people living with disabilities already received. There was a lot more work to do. And when, and when the new parliament was elected in the fall, an ongoing priority of the NDP has been to call on the government to present 
new legislation, better legislation, legislation that would actually tell Canadians living with disabilities what the government has in mind in terms of providing far better ongoing income support for people living with disabilities. Why is that important? Because under the current federal programs and under provincial programs across the country, people living with disabilities have been consistently legislated into poverty. To the extent that someone living with a disability has to rely on existing disability pensions of various kinds across the country, none of them provide an income that brings you to the poverty line, which means as soon as you have to rely on those things, you know that you're going to be living a life of poverty with all of the challenges that come with that, and those are, and, and the, and those are challenges of poverty over and above the challenges people living with disabilities already face. So uh, with great work from my, my, my colleague, the NDP disability critic in this parliament, uh, pressing the government to bring legislation forward, we finally uh, got wind on the notice paper that that, that that legislation was coming. It was an exciting moment. We had hoped to get more detail, just as we had hoped that certain changes to the disability tax credit in this legislation might have meant that, that finally the government might have acted on the longstanding call by people living with type 1 diabetes to actually make their life easier and make their ac access to the disability tax credit uh, available. That was a disappointment initially and working together across party lines we were able to remedy that. Similarly, the tabling of, of the Canada disability legislation, I almost said the new legislation but I think that would have been to misspeak Madam Speaker because in fact it's pretty much the same legislation and it has a, the same problems, therefore. It doesn't spell out what the program is supposed to look like. It doesn't let Canadians living with disabilities know what kind of financial help and the extent of financial support they could hope to receive from the federal government. And I would go one further, Madam Speaker, and say that the, part of the problem with legislation like this, there's a couple, that essentially just empowers cabinet to design a program and then would fund that program by statute without having to return to Parliament. There's a, there's a procedural question, which I think may be less interesting to a lot of, a lot of Canadians, but I think that procedural question is, is important to the extent that Parliament is a place that, that is meant to provide oversight on government spending. This is a bill that would empower the government to create a program without having any idea what the price tag is, uh, when they should actually be quite clear with Parliament um, how the program is going to be designed and parliamentarians should be able to authorize a new program like that knowing those things. So that's a problem. But the other problem with setting up that program in legislation without, without actually legislating it is that a future government and a future cabinet that doesn't agree with that program or who wants to change it won't have to come back to this place. There'll be no legislative process which also means that in the time that it normally takes for a bill to go through the House of Commons and through the Senate, there won't be that same time. That's the time that civil society often uses to mobilize in order to influence the content of legislation and government policy. And that is also an opportunity lost. It will make it very easy for a future government to undo whatever this government, if it finally gets around to creating a program for the Canada Disability Benefit does, it will be far too easy for it to be undone. And I think our experience at committee with the initial disappointment around the disability tax credit shows that a minority parliament can come together and can have a positive influence on government policy and legislation and get things done for people that a majority government clearly would not have done because it wasn't in their proposal. I'd point also to the example of employment insurance reform, something that the government promised uh, in its election campaign in 2015. We've had two elections since. The government's been in power now coming up on seven years, and yet we haven't seen any meaningful EI reform. The, of course, we have to bracket a lot of what happened in the pandemic because there was substantial changes to the EI program during the pandemic. But the, but the speed with which those uh, reforms occurred, I think, show that it is possible to make meaningful reform quickly. And the nature of many of those reforms show that what workers have been asking for in their EI program is in fact possible. This isn't pie in the sky stuff. 
most of what they've been asking for are things that the government did through the EI program during the pandemic. And yet, as the pandemic recedes somewhat, at least for the moment, certainly the government is of that view when they're talking about their financial support programs, less so when they're talking about uh, public health restrictions. As the, as the pandemic recedes somewhat, the government is going back to its regular inaction on the employment insurance file. And they finally did try and do something. I would say an important but relatively minor in the grand scheme of systemic employment insurance reform. They presented a proposal to change the EI appeal board and to undo some of the damage that was done by the Harper government to the EI appeal board and fell flat on their face, Madam Speaker. It was not well received, even by the very people the government itself sought to please with those reforms. They were lambasted for them and sought themselves to remove that part of the budget bill and get it out. And New Democrats were pleased to support that for two reasons. One, because we agreed that those reforms were misguided and didn't represent what I would dare to call a consensus uh, among EI stakeholders about how the, the system and particularly the appeal board has to change. But we were also glad to support it on, on a condition that was satisfied, which was that the minister declare publicly that they would bring legislation back in the fall in order to make better changes, changes that people would actually welcome to the EI appeal board system. So having had that commitment, we were happy to support the removal of those appeal board uh, changes that I think were, were quite ill conceived. But it does raise a question of trust in the government. One wonders how it is that after being in government for well over six and a half years, having not really made any major reforms to EI except those that were forced by pandemic circumstances, when they finally came out of the gate to do something, how they could get it so terribly wrong. And I take some solace in the fact that we have a minority parliament, that Canadians didn't entrust the Liberals with a majority of seats here in the House of Commons, that they don't have 100% of the power in this place, and that negotiation is possible, because I think it's leading to better outcomes. Another example that, that's a little outside the scope of this particular bill, but an important one while we're talking about the pandemic, again, at the Finance Committee early on in this parliament, one of the first things that the Finance Committee did was to deal with Bill C-2, which established the new pandemic benefit regime that has now expired but was instituted in December and was effectively the pandemic support regime that saw us through the Omicron wave with some notable changes by order and council right after the legislation passed because as, as New Democrats said at the time and the reason for which we voted against that legislation was because we thought it would be inadequate to the task. Um, but I, I digress on that. I, I've given that speech here in this place. What I want to zero in on is an important change that was made to those programs, particularly the wage subsidy program that was conceived in that bill. And working with uh, members of the Bloc and the Conservative Party, we were able to pass an amendment that said that companies that were receiving wage subsidy money under that program, under the authority of Bill C-2, would not be allowed to pay dividends to shareholders while accepting money from the government, presumably because they didn't have enough revenue to stay afloat. And clearly, if they're making big, pay, big dividend payments to their shareholders, they did have the money. Uh, and so that was an appropriate reform. It was the kind of thing that New Democrats had called for at the inception of the wage subsidy program that the government wouldn't agree to initially. And I think we finally found a way, again, working across party lines, which is not always easy to do. But it's a worthwhile thing to always try to do. And I think this was an example, again, of where this parliament was able to correct course for a government that had got off on the wrong foot. And so it's why I think you know, it, really, it really does matter, and I think it serves Canadians well, that we're in a parliament that doesn't have a majority government. And I do hope that that's something Canadians will consider in the next election, but also that they'll consider when uh, organizations like Fair Vote approach them to talk about electoral reform. And, you know, I mean, I, I would remind some of my uh, conservative colleagues, and we've got into it a little bit over, over the budget debate, as is the want 
of folks around here, and it's not it's not a bad thing. But I mean, they will know that they actually got more share of the popular vote than the Liberals were in power here, but they got far less of the seats. We just saw in the Ontario election, New Democrats get about 30 seats to the Liberals approximately eight, despite having roughly an equal share of the popular vote. And we saw the uh, Ford government form, form, form a uh, majority with uh, a very small amount of support when you consider how low turnout was and how the way we vote under the first-past-the-post system can generate very distorted electoral outcomes. And so, you know, I, I raise all these things to, to both um, contribute to the debate on this bill, but also, I hope, contribute to a larger debate about how we elect governments and, how, and indeed, how we elect parliaments that select governments here in uh, Canada to show that we have been doing good work in this parliament we have been correcting course for the government when they've got it wrong on the first go, and that has been made possible by virtue of having a minority parliament. It's exactly because we don't have a majority that these corrections and some of the good things that came out of the committee process have been, have been possible. One of the things I hope we may yet make progress on, and that I'll be looking to colleagues and other parties for, for support on, is the call for uh, a low-income CERB repayment amnesty. This is something that's come up at the Finance Committee, we've heard compelling testimony. I think there's an important moral dimension to that. So we're talking about people whose incomes already are below the poverty line. And we just saw CTV did a piece on this last week, but this isn't new, it's been a running story and it's had various permutations through the pandemic of the CRA sending uh, letters to Canadians already in very difficult financial straits, even before the current round of inflation hit us and all the more so now that people are struggling with the cost of groceries and, and, and I mean, the cost of housing has been an issue, let's not kid ourselves for a long time. It, that, the, the rate of acceleration of the problem got worse during the pandemic, but the problem was there and getting worse even before the uh, pandemic. And now as we're in, that, in this time, people who applied in good faith for, for help were told to apply, in some cases by their very own uh, Liberal MP, are now getting letters saying, you have to pay this money back, you didn't qualify, you weren't eligible. In some cases, it's people who applied for EI and would have preferred just to get their EI, but were told, no, you can only get CERB. So then they got the CERB check and they figured, okay, well then that's, that's what I'm entitled to. I applied for EI, I was told no, I got the CERB, they sent me the check, I didn't ask for it, so this must be okay. They spent the money because they had lost their job and they were trying to get through a global pandemic, which I think we can all agree was not an easy thing to do, no matter what your income was, let alone if you just lost your job. And, and now the government is asking them for that money back. But they don't have the money. And the efforts to collect that money, particularly from people who are already below the poverty line, are not gonna bear fruit. So there's the moral dimension in terms of the anxiety and the financial harm that it's causing, but there's also a very real financial dimension. And we've heard a little bit about that at uh, committee. The government is planning to spend somewhere in the ballpark of $260 million chasing after CERB debt. That is a function of their own program. That's a function of how they publicize that program. That is a function of the way they encourage people and in some cases forced people into the CERB system as opposed to the employment insurance system. And the question is, for the $260 million that they're going to spend over the next three or four years chasing that debt, how much are they actually going to get back? I think it's unlikely that they're going to get back $260 million. You know what I'd love? I'd love to know. I'd love to have the government tell us how much they think they're actually going to get back. I've asked the question. I've asked it at committee. I've asked it in a number of different fora, and I can't get an answer. It is shocking to me that the government would decide to invest $260 million in collecting a debt that they don't know the value of, let alone the likelihood of succeeding. And so when we're talking about over a quarter million dollars invested in collecting a debt, you'd want to be darn sure that you're actually going to get that money back. And I would put to you, Madam Speaker, that even if they'd make their money back and call it a wash, spend $260 million, get $260 million, which I think is very unlikely, it wouldn't be worth it. It wouldn't be worth it because the time and expense that they're, sending, that they're spending chasing after low-income Canadians who are already in dire straits, particularly in this context of inflation, 
is time and resources that they could spend chasing tax evaders who are hiding their money out of the country and using other means to not pay their fair share, they get a better return. And so there's a good financial argument for a low-income CERB repayment amnesty, and I hope that in the context of this parliament that I've been talking about, we'll find support among enough other parties that we can convince the government to do the right thing, to, to not chase that debt and try and wring it out of low-income Canadians, but instead divert the CRA's resources to chasing the people who are really getting away with something, not paying their fair share, who have the resources to pay it back. And I thank you very much uh, for the time, Madam Speaker. Questions and commentaires. Questions and comments, l'honorable député Jonquière. The honorable member for Jonquière. Joliet, sorry. I'd like to commend my colleague uh, on his speech. It's always very interesting and constructive what he has to say here in the House or in committee. My question is about how many pages there are in this bill. C-19 is a mammoth omnibus bill. There are a lot of different pieces of legislation that it affects. They're not just things that have to do with the budget. For example, it refers to the justice system in space. It talks about strip searches in jails. So my question is, I'd like to know what his position is on the fact that this government is routinely producing these omnibus bills, these mammoth pieces of legislation, which make it very hard for parliamentary committees to study in depth. And my sub-question is, the paper version we were given in the opposition was 400 and some pages, whereas the official version, the online PDF, is over 450 pages long. So I'd like to hear what he has to say about that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'll begin with the sub-question. Obviously, it's a problem when documents tabled here in the House do not reflect the full version I would say it's part of a problem that concerns me a little bit. And now we see paper copies are not really tabled at all anymore. And with the, uh, for example, with the um, estimates as an MP, I wasn't able to get a copy of the blue book, so uh, the increasingly we're seeing the government accepting w working digitally, and I personally work better with a paper copy, so I find it a bit difficult, especially when it's a massive piece of legislation. This is something that was highly criticized, and I think rightly so. And if governments are to continue to table mammoth pieces of legislation, I think we're going to have to have a unique process for budget bills. Comments, questions, and commentaires. The Honourable Member for Sandwich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and to my Honourable Colleague from Amwood Transcona, thank you for um, a thoughtful discussion of what minority parliaments can do together. I also lament, uh, as does my, my colleague from Kitchener Centre, the failure to provide the disability tax benefit. We expected it. It should have been in the budget. It should have been in C-19. I appreciate that we've made some progress for people with type 1 diabetes, but it's not nearly enough nor fast enough. But uh, he won't be surprised to know that I, I, I want to ask him to expand on his points about proportional representation. Uh, it certainly is timely. The results from Ontario being the lowest voter turnout, as I understand it, in the history of that province, barely 43 percent um, voted, which means that nearly 60 percent of Ontario voters didn't vote. I was taken with a column, I don't know if you saw it, in Rabble magazine, Rabble newspaper by Carl Nirenberg, that posited that all the 
uh, fetishing and co coverage by the media of just looking at the polling and kind of pronouncing Doug Ford was going to win before the campaign started. Does he feel that that played a role in, in, in reducing voter turnout? Number four, I'm with Transcona. Well, uh, thank you very much to uh, my colleague for that, for that question. And I, I do often uh, worry about the extent to which the publishing of polls can affect public opinion. Um, but I think that that is something that is accentuated in a first-past-the-post system. Because if, if, you, uh, if, you, if you have a proportional system of some kind, then in spite of whatever polling is saying about who's going to win the most seats, you can still feel that you're contributing to electing people that you agree with and who are going to speak on your behalf and are going to be raising issues that are of importance to you. And so I think that that, I think that effect is uh, amplified by the voting system that we have. And then unfortunately, getting information about where people at are, are at and, and the kind of uh, attitude that pundits have when they're predicting outcomes can affect uh, voter, voter turnout. And I would hope that by moving towards some kind of proportional system that we could diminish those, those effects because people can still go and vote with comments, I was, or, or vote with, with confidence that there'll be an outcome. I was quite disheartened by the recent comments of the Prime Minister um, about uh, proportional representation and I think some rewriting of history in terms of what he presented to the electorate in uh, 2015. And uh, perhaps someone else will want to ask me a question about that. I can elaborate a little further. Member for Skeena Buckley Valley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, thank you to my brilliant colleague from Elma Transcona for his speech. And incidentally, I was going to ask him about the Prime Minister's recent comments, which I was shocked to see, frankly. I thought they were uh, flippant and, and really did not do justice to uh, the history and the commitment that he made to Canadians. Uh, a, a broken promise that I think. Um, really betrayed so many people in this country, especially young people. Could he, could he speak to his own reaction to the Prime Minister's uh, recent response? The Honourable Member for Elmwood Transcona. Yeah, I, I was flabbergasted, frankly. I, I think that's a proper parliamentary term. I, I could express my feelings a few other ways, but they might not be as parliamentary. Um, and at least in two senses. I was, I was surprised uh, first of all, at the fact that he just kind of blanketly said, oh, well, any time you have proportional representation, you have bitter disagreement and polarization, as if that's something that isn't happening here in Canada. I wish it weren't, but I don't think that any competent follower of politics could pretend like we don't have real issues of polarization, division, and excessive antagonism in Canadian politics. That's a real thing. So it was an interesting kind of a blind spot. Also, you know, for a prime minister who's shown up at, at rallies where there's been that on display in ways that I condemn and that I think are inappropriate, also I think was a little, it was a little much to somehow pretend like there aren't countries with proportional representation that aren't doing at least a good job of managing polarization within their politics. And then also surprise that he would try and say that he only ever advocated for a ranked ballot and that he was never really interested in proportional representation. Other members have an opportunity to ask questions. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Red Deer Mountain View. <laughs> Speaker, and uh, to the member from Elmwood Transcona, it's certainly uh, interesting discussions. And I know, as he mentioned, as far as proportional representation, I guess a lot of people aren't overly surprised with the Prime Minister being somewhat flippant about anything that he um, thinks might cause a little bit of uh, consternation for people. But what I would like to ask him, uh, we've just heard uh, a week or so ago from the former Minister uh, Bill Morneau um, about some of the constraints and concerns that he had when he was trying to, uh, to present budgets and, uh, and to try and look at competitiveness. And uh, basically said that it is not happening here with the present government. So I'm curious whether he has some ideas as how we can move forward to encourage competitiveness here in Canada. Honourable Member for Elmwood Transcona. Well, thank you very much. And it may not surprise the member that I may have a different take on what constitutes uh, building a kind of competitive culture. But I do want to offer some remarks to that effect. So, you know, when companies are looking to locate, uh, you know, we often hear about the importance of the, of, of the tax regime. But other things that we know they look for, 
is, is a well-trained and available workforce. And so investing in people can also increase our, our, our productivity and our competitiveness. So I think the government should be looking to, to be investing in training and connecting workers who currently don't have work and, and aren't able to get hired into the kinds of jobs they want with particular jobs with real employers that are, that are, that are asking for that so that there's a clear pathway through their education to a job that's already waiting for them at the end. I think things like a national pharmacare plan and dental, dental care, which also help attract talent uh, when you provide it on a universal basis, that's something that companies benefit from because they don't have to pay for it, but it's something that helps them attract talent. And so I think that's also a, an important component of building a uh, competitive environment here for Canada to uh, attract investment. I know that where the economy is going, not just here in Canada, but globally, has to do with reforming our, our, our energy infrastructure. And I think public investment can help lead the development of talent, not just for workers, but for companies as well, that can then be exported out of Canada to help other countries build. And uh, that's all the time we have. <laughs>